Maybe you just need to come and confess to the Lord that maybe your repentant heart. Praise God. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm still flying high. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to talk this morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of John. Very familiar verse of scripture. I'm sure you'll read it many, many times. And sometimes we read a scripture so much we kind of read through it. When we go to read the word again, we go back and, and we don't, especially sometimes the first verses or greetings or something of that nature, and we kind of ease through that without really stopping and, and getting the meat of what has been seven, said. I want, to, I want to cover the first seven verses of Scripture this morning. I'm not going to go way over, but I am going to go over a little bit this morning. So, uh, you know, don't get too anxious to leave. Uh, you know, I'm always trying to urge you to be here on time. Now, see, what would have happened this morning had you not been here on time? You would have missed that first move of God. Now, I'm going to tell you, when, when the first wave hit, it was right out of the gate. I mean, it was right out of the gate. I knew God was here. I knew He was moving. And that's what happens when you skip praise and worship. You miss sometimes one of the greater moves of God that we've ever had in this church we had this morning. Amen. And if you didn't recognize that, well, I'm sorry you missed it because I didn't. Okay? And so I believe that that is just the tip of the iceberg to what God wants to do here. And I really do. And so nothing happens in the kingdom of God without first going to the beginning, going to the Word of God itself. John, I'm going to go ahead and read the verses of Scripture, and then we'll go back over them a little more later. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning. What does the beginning mean? And not just talking about creation. <laughs> it actually means in the, in the dateless past. God has always been. You go, well, I don't understand that. Well, you join the crowd. Nobody does. It's hard for us and our little finite minds to really grasp the infinity of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In other words, this Bible was before man was. The Word has always been the Word. Again, I don't understand that. Well, you want crap. And the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Now, he's talking here about Jesus, talking about the Christ. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Talking about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Amen. The first thing we have to understand about the Word of God, I, I, I'm just, I'm bought and sold on the Word of God. Amen. I, I, uh, I have learned so many things from studying this Word. Now, I'm not saying I'm a, a great theologian. I'm not boasting there on that. But I'm, I'm, I'm bragging on the Lord that He has taught me through this yeah. precious Word. I am... I would probably be like the Lord. I would probably be a little bit discouraged over the average Christian's desire to read the Word. Most of us that are Christians have us a Bible presented somewhere on the coffee table in the main room of the home to kind of give the idea that, hey, we're godly people. We love the Word of God, but we don't ever crack that thing open, don't ever look at it, don't ever read it. If you're going to be a believer, you have to accept this Word. Amen. You have to accept the Word and, and, and again, I'm appalled, and I'm sure the Lord is saddened by many in the church today who say, well, 
the Word of God is a good book, and there's some good lessons in there. But they don't really believe that it is in, in the Holy Ghost inspired Word of God. There are ministers, some some whole denominations that, for the most part, the ministers do not see this as the inerrant Word of God. If this is not the inerrant Word of God, if this is not what God intended man to read, study, and to learn, then we're all in a heap of trouble. If there's a lie in it, if something is said in here and someone proves that it is not true, then none of it is true. Because by its very nature, it has to be all true. It can't be 99.9% .9 any more than God wants 99.9% .9 of your heart. It is the inerrant Word of God. It has been attacked probably the most burned book in the world. It's obviously the number one seller in all of the world, which would make it easy for it to be the most burned book because so many people have tried to stamp it out. China right now has a full-fledged assault on the church in China. You need to pray for the Chinese. And I said, well, I thought they were our enemy. The Bible says the priests were your enemies. The Christians are certainly not our enemy. And the church, <laughs> the devil never learns. Because wherever he tries to stamp out this word, it prospers. I wished I had a clip of a, a Gideon's clip that I believe it was Gideon's. It might not have been Gideon's. It might have been some other uh, entity. Well, they had shipped some Bibles to the Chinese people, and they were in boxes. They were just simple Bibles. They weren't anything fancy like the silver lining or anything that I have on mine here. They were just simple written word uh, Bibles. Have you ever seen clips of Walmart on Black Friday where people act like absolute morons and idiots trying to get to that 55-inch TV that they just got to have. Have you ever seen that, anybody? Am I the only one that, yeah, yeah I know y'all don't ever watch TV. Uh, all of you have seen that, or at least you've heard of it. That's what these Chinese look like going for those Bibles. And it broke my heart, not only for them to be so eager for the Word, but it broke my heart that we're not that eager here in this country. You have the Bible, you can buy it in any fashion, shape, you can get any color, any uh, uh, translation, you can get it in verbal form. I had one man that used to come here, he said, well, I can't read, so I can't study the Bible. I said, brother, you can buy cassette tapes to go in your truck. Slap those cassette tapes and you can listen to the Bible all day long. You'd rather listen to some preacher than you have the Word of God. That's okay to listen to a preacher, but I said, you got to understand, you need to study the Word of God. You need to hear the Word of God. I can't think of it. You know, if I spent 12 hours, 14 hours a day in a truck, I can't think of anything be better to put that in that cassette tape than the Word of God, If I, especially if I couldn't read. He didn't want to do that. He'd rather remain ignorant of what this Word says and take somebody else's Word for it. You need to study the Word of God. And in order to do that, you have to accept. There's four things I want to bring out, and I was going to preach all of this today. Ain't happening. Everybody say, ain't happening. Amen. All right. Four things about the Word of God that I want to point out. First thing is you have to accept it as God's Word. you got to make up your mind that this is the Word of God. Because if you doubt its authenticity, if you doubt its authority, if you doubt the Word is what God would have you as mankind to understand, then that's as far as you're going to go with God. You're not going to be able to defend your beliefs. You're not going to be able to defend your God. You're not going to be able to understand what the Word of God says. Because that's the second thing you have to do. Once you accept the Word of God, 
you have to understand the Word of God. And that doesn't mean you have to be brilliant or you have to be a Bible theologian, but you got to understand what the Word of God imparts into you. you got to understand that this Word is designed, divinely designed, to imprint upon your heart that Word and to teach you and to show you. The third thing you've got to do is once you accept it and once you begin to understand it, you've got to apply it. I know people that can sit there and quote that word of God to you all day long. And they live like the devil. There are most of your... university theologian professors or atheists. Now they, they, they sit and quote me on this Bible all day long. They can tell me chapter and verse and sit there and quote it to me. Make me look like I don't know nothing. But they don't have it in their heart. They've never really accepted it because they don't understand it. They accept it as a good book. You can't accept it as a good book. When you accept it as the Word of God, then you're going to begin to understand it because the Holy Ghost is going to help you to understand that Word. I don't care how little education you have. It's just like the gentleman I'm talking about. Love the brother to death. But if you not have the capacity to read the Word of God, it needs to be imparted unto you. That Word needs to be there. The fourth thing is, once you begin to apply it, once you begin to live what this Word says, you need to declare it. Oh, Brother Marlon, that's your job. You're the preacher. It is my job. It is my job. But the Bible tells us, 2 Timothy 4 and 25, I believe it is, tells us that he told Timothy, he said, do the work of an evangelist. I believe that's a mandate to every believer. Now, I'm not talking about going out and setting up meetings and, and having tent meetings and camp revivals. I'm talking about do the work of an evangelist. What does an evangelist do? He takes the word to where he goes. And you go places that I'll never go. You'll see people I'll never see. You'll know people that I don't know. You will be able to converse with people that I probably will never have the opportunity to do so. So you're to do the work of an evangelist. You're to declare this word. So there's four things here. We want to accept it. We want to begin to understand it. We want to apply it to our life. And then we want to declare it. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. The reason you have to accept this Word of God is the fact that it is the truth. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if it was in the beginning, if it was before earth, then it is obviously is, in fact, the infallible Word of God. And people want to question that. People, like I say, all those people that burned all these Bibles, they don't believe that it's the Word of God. If they believe that, they wouldn't have burned them. The Chinese government realized that uh, they're literally signing, their, they're literally cursing themselves by persecuting the church. They don't accept it as the Word of God. But as a believer, we have to come into that place we got to make up our mind. This is my word. This is, this is what I'm going to live by. What this word says to me, I'm going to take it as if it's from God himself. Because if you don't accept it as the word of God, the book of Judges talks about uh, the judges, obviously. But basically it says in there, I think it's two or three different times, it uses the terminology, and man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, if Don's got his version of the Bible, and how I have my version of the Bible, his version might say, well, Jesus is the only way. Mine might say, well, Jesus is the only way if you uh, join my church. If you join the church I go to, then you go to heaven. There's some denominations out there that will tell you, if you're not in their denomination, you ain't going to make it. I don't read that in this word. I do not read that in this word. It's not in there. I've read it from cover to cover. And so we have to accept this as the word of God, and everything has to be based on the truth of that. The truth of who God is 
and the fact this verse here tells us verse 1 tells us that he was with God but then it says and the word was God and so we know that this word is of Jesus Christ we know it is who our Redeemer is who our who our Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ and we understand that and we, we, we receive that and we, we stand upon that understanding we have to know that it is divinely inspired. People say, no, man wrote that. And so if it's of man, it's not of God. Well, you either believe that what was written, yes, it, that's true. There's 66 books in this Bible, and there's approximately 40 authors. There's a couple of books they're not sure who wrote what. But you got approximately 40 men that wrote these scriptures down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, I would not have wanted that responsibility. But I know that there was a supernatural anointing upon these men to write these things down. And God put it together. There's a lot of good writing out there that is not the Bible, but it was not accepted as part of God's written word. So we know that what's in here, or we, we, we believe that what is in here is the best of what we need to know that we got really and truly the word of God because there's no, there's no major contradictions of any kind within that word. It does not contradict itself. People try to cherry pick certain things. Go, oh, wait, wait a minute, this is different. You know, this gospel says this and this gospel says it different. Well, if we had a man run in here in a clown's uniform and run around the church and he run, let's say, six times around the church and then he went out that door and then I sit down and interviewed you, I said, okay, uh, Virginia, uh, what color was the uniform? Well, it was red on top and blue in the middle and yellow with green stripes. And then I asked Renita the same thing. She said, no, nah, I think it was blue on top and, and, and I think those stripes were orange. You see, there's two different people with two different perspectives. And so just because the Gospels don't say things the same way, what you focus on and what you want to try to understand is what is being said. Was the blind man healed or, or was he not? Well, this one used words that other one didn't. Well, that's two different people writing. And so you're going to have different perspectives of things, but the, the truth of that, it always goes back to the truth. The truth of that is what you base your belief on. You base your belief on the truth. You want to cherry pick that this person said it was blue, this person said something a little differently from that, or described it in a different way. Well, that's 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 mankind. It doesn't mean that they're not Holy Spirit inspired. Everything written in this Word is inspired by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost does not contradict itself. Some. 19 years ago, I began to pastor this church as Four Square Church at that time. And I chose certain individuals to be my council members. And I told my council that day, I said, now here's, here's the number one rule for all of you. I said, we pray about everything we do. You made your decision to be made, we're going to pray about it. And I said, if you will seek the Holy Spirit, if you'll seek the Spirit of God, He's not going to tell you to go left and you to go right. right. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear what I'm saying here because, I'm not, again, I'm not, this is not a boast. It's, a, it's an illustration of how the Holy Ghost works. Amen. My current council, I've reiterated that to them. From time to time, I reiterate that to the council that we don't make a decision in this church without the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I said, if you pray about it, you pray about it, and you pray about it, and I pray about it. Guess what? The Holy Ghost is not going to say, you go left, you go right, you go to the middle. He's going to tell us all the same thing. And I want you to hear what I'm saying here. Again, not a boast. It, if it's a boast, it's a boast on who God is and what he's all about. In 19 years, 19 years, you've never had a dissenting vote in the council. Think about that. And that's people that are focused on what the Holy Ghost says because they know that they're doing God's business for this church. And so that, that understanding is not about one person getting their way. It's about the Holy Spirit telling us all the same thing. Well, that same principle applies to these 40-something men that wrote this word. 
And so to, to, to know the authenticity of this word is to know that this was written over a period of maybe 1,500 years. In other words, these men were not, uh, they were not cousins. They were not, some of them necessarily didn't even know, for the most part, didn't know the others. And they were born in different eras. They were born in different times, but yet the word is consistent. From Genesis to Revelation, it's a consistent word. It is a word that agrees with the other part. A lot of people, a lot of ministers want to throw out the Old Testament and go, oh, that's just law. I don't preach the Old Testament anymore. You can't throw out the Old Testament. And so many, so many gems and so many pearls on that word, you can't throw it out. It's not meant to be thrown out. The covenant was changed, but the word did not change. For the first part, everything in the Old Testament told about what was to come. It just confirms the New Testament. All the shadows and types throughout the Word of God predict that that was to come. The Old Testament saints look forward to that that was coming. The New, New Testament saints look back at what happened. Okay? And that's what we base our belief on because this Word is universal throughout. It does not contradict itself. No matter the challenges that have come, the, the questions, theologians are always going to try to cherry pick a, a problem in there. Either that or they're going to begin to talk about God telling uh, the nation of Israel to slay all these people. There's a whole lot more to that. That's another sermon for another day. But there are reasons that God told them to do those kind of things. And there are people who want to misinterpret the Word of God say, well, God, you know, God's a mean God because he told him to do this or he told him to do that. Well, God's God. I don't really think it's a wise decision to go around questioning what God's motives are about that. But all of that, deal, all of that deals with the fact that Israel is God's chosen people. And there was a purpose and a plan behind that because when they began to mingle with others, Solomon's a very good example of that. Solomon had more wives and concubines and Carter got little liver pills. And what he ended up doing was allowing false gods and false idols to come into his life, and it destroyed the nation of Israel. By the time he got out of office, Rehoboam and Jeroboam took over, and the nation of Israel split exactly why God told him to do what he did. And I just preached that, and that's another book for another day. But at any rate, we, we accept this word because we know it's from God. How do you know who God is? The word tells me. How do you know what God wants me to do? The Word tells me. Amen. It's a divinely Holy Spirit inspired Word of God. Amen. It is not to be taken lightly. It's not to be taken with a grain of salt. It is to be understood as God speaking to us. Amen. I know of no other written document anywhere in the face, on the face of the planet that has touched as many lives as this word has. I've heard so many, I love the Gideon stories uh, of how people receive the word of God through some just almost uh, Holy Ghost uh, miracle of some sort. And I've told this before and I'll tell it again, the, the, the man throwing the Bible on the rooftop and hitting the man in the head with it, I was, that's my fa all time favorite. And I'll just tell you this because this is the extent of what God will do to put the Word of God in people's hearts. I know most of you tithe and you give, and that's a good thing, and I, I'm thank, very thankful for that. But if you ever get an opportunity to purchase a Bible or to give to one of the good uh, Bible entities, Gideons, or, or, or even American Bible Society, uh, there, uh, there's another one that I can't call right off the top of my head, but there's several of them. Just make sure that the Bibles go like they say they're going to go. If you get a chance to buy a Bible, put that Word of God in somebody. Else. That one Bible that you buy might end up winning somebody to the Lord. Uh, and there's so many miraculous stories about how this Word has changed life. I remember reading an article one time about a church in Russia. They were obviously, this was back in the Cold War period, and Christianity was not at all... Uh, acceptable unless it was the state church run by the government. There was a group of people that would meet once every week. They didn't have a Bible, but they had, I think it was nine pages 
of the Old Testament. It was the end of one book and the beginning of another. That church grew from a handful of people. And I don't remember the numbers. I don't even want to guess because I may be way off. But I remember the church grew as they studied those nine pages for years and years and years and years. Now, this is not New Testament. This is not even invoking the name of Jesus. But God moved through those nine pages of that word of God to minister to those people because there was no word to be had. And we, we you know, I can't bring myself, I said, you go to garage sales and you see all these little Gideon Bibles. I can't bring myself to throw them away. I can't do it. I've got, I don't know how many Bibles, but some of them I've gotten at garage sales and things of that nature through the years and different places and different people not wanting that and just throwing them. We have Bibles all over this place. It's a precious word. And it doesn't matter if it's a fancy copy, leather bound. We've even got people out there now that are autographing their Bibles. And Trump got kind of beat up over that. I don't know about preachers signing Bibles out to me. It kind of doesn't sit well with me, but that's, I'm not condemning it. I just don't, I don't get it. But at any rate, this word, you got to accept it. you got to know that this is the word of God. Because everything that we believe is based on what it says. Everything that we need is based on what it says. We need this word to draw nigh unto God. We need to know who he is, and what he is about, what he would have of us. It tells of our relationship with him. It tells of our, our, uh, our, our necessity of our serving him. Everything's in this book. And if we don't seek that out, if we don't search that out, if you're no more interested in the Bible than to pick it up once every now and then and read it, then you need to pray about that. You need to pray about your desire and or slash lack of desire to read the Word. And I know sometimes, you know, we, we say, well, I'm just so tired, you know, and I, I get in from work, and I'm just beat, Brother Maul. You don't know how hard I work, and it's tough. Well, I, I have the same issues. Sometimes I'm too tired to read the Word of God. So I changed my whole realm of, of Bible study because I was a late in the day type Bible study. And I changed it to the morning. I made a priority out of reading my Word. I can't think of anything, any way outside of prayer, a better way to start your day than to read the Word. And what you do, and this is just a suggestion, you may do it differently and you may, be, you may do better with it at night. I'm not telling you you can't study the Word at night. That's not my point. My point is, set you a routine and stick to that routine. You know, I started working out about two and a half years ago, and I have attributed the fact that I didn't break every bone in my body to the fact that I worked out. My wife pointed it out to me. She said, you know, you could have broke your back, your hip, your arms, your shoulders. You could have busted your big old head open, but you didn't. And I attribute that to the fact that I had exercised and I had strengthened my body and it was it hadn't been for that brick, I'd have survived the whole thing. Same thing applies to the Word of God. Don't walk around here being a weakling as a Christian. Do some exercise. Get that, exercise those eyes and open that heart and mind up to that Word. Let that Word get down in you. Let that Word get down in, I'll use this word, the marrow of your bones. Let it get down deep in you and begin to minister to you and to show you who you are. We just sang that song. This is who I am. That Word declares who we are. And we need to get that Word and know that it, we need to understand it. We need to study it. We need to cherish it. We need to take that Word and put it down deep in our inner man and get it down in that spirit and live off of that day after day after day. Had a bad day yesterday. Where well, did you read your word? Well, no, I was too tired. I'm well, sure you get tired. You don't think the devil won't make you tired? You don't think the devil won't make you go to sleep when you read your word? Try reading it. That's one reason I used to do it at night because it helped me sleep. There ain't nothing wrong with studying it in the morning and at night. You know, just to be honest about it. <coughs> you got to get that word down in you. Amen. You got to speak it. You got to. You you you, you got to believe it. You got to stand on what it says. 
if you accept it, accept it for the value. Accept it that, that you see, this word changed my standards. You say, well, I thought Jesus did that. Well, the word was God. Amen. Okay? Yeah, Jesus did it, but this word works hand in hand with the Trinity. It is, it, is the, it is the essence of what we understand. And I don't want to get ahead of myself with understanding. But, but you, you accept it. You accept its validity. You accept it. And you don't care. This is now my standard. When I got saved, I had a set of standards. I mean, I was no ogre, you know. I wasn't the world's number one criminal or anything. But my standards were a little out of priority. <coughs> Excuse me. My standards not everything that they needed to be. But the moment I got saved, the Word began to come into my heart. It began to illuminate my mind. And I began to receive what it was saying. And I was gobbling it up like it was my favorite chocolate pie. And I was eating that Word up day in and day out. And I, and I have repented over the fact that I'm not quite as eager now sometimes as I was back then. I wish I could keep that fervor. You need to pray for that fervor to just have an insatiable appetite. You know, you can still bring me some chocolate pie and I ain't probably going to be able to say no to it. You know, I've never lost my taste for chocolate pie. That's what I'm saying. You don't need to lose your taste for this word. You need to understand that there's more nourishment in two verses or in one verse of this Bible than there are and everything else you can read out there. There's nothing wrong with reading Christian books. There's nothing wrong with, with, with uh, different uh, aspects of being able to learn of God. Those things are all good tools. But the meat of it, the meat of it needs to come straight from here. You're reading a book and he's uh, doing, or he or she is doing too much supposing. They're not relying upon this word for whatever it is that they're trying to teach or show you. That's the reason I had such a problem with the uh, 40 days of purpose. It was not scriptural. He was not using scripture. He was using his ideas about how things had to be. And there were a lot of errors in some of the things that he did try to use scripture on. And I, I said this before, we're probably on church in this town, didn't do 40 days of purpose. Everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Why? Because it's the most popular book going at the time. Where is it today? Name me one church is still doing 40 days of purpose. It's a fad, like a lot of things. This is no fad. This is not going to be here today and gone tomorrow. This has been around for a long, long time. And the devil has done everything he can to stamp it out. Like I say, he's burned it, he's banned it, he's ridiculed it, he's mocked it. <laughs> still the number one seller in all the world. Still the number one seller in all the world. That is the word of God, folks. This is what he intended. This is what the church was built on. Jesus said, I go away and I send you a comforter. And they began the church. Acts chapter 1, verses uh, chapter 2. All the way through the book of Acts talks about how the church was growing at that time. And the Bible tells us that the church increased because of this word. You see, we've got to we've got to accept it. We got to get enough understanding of it that we can begin to apply it to our lives, so that we can declare it to others. You can't declare something to other people that you're not living yourself. You can, but that makes you a hypocrite. And we don't need any hypocrite. We don't need to be hypocritical about this word. We need to live as closely as we can by the standards of this word. We need to accept it. Who it's from? Who is this word from? We know it's from God. We know that in our spirit. Why do we know? Because the Holy Ghost bears witness. When you got saved. How do you know you got saved? How do you know that there was a Jesus? You know, I know people that's gotten saved, they didn't have a clue about God. I never will forget the young man. I still need to pray for him from that time. He come to this church about a year or so ago. And he came down. I gave an invitation like I gave her, and he came down here. And I said the same thing to him that I say to most people, and we began to pray. But I, I told him, I said, and the key to all of this, I said, you can pray all the prayers in the world. But I said, if you don't believe, then you're just, you're just mouthing words. I said, nothing's going to change in your heart. And he looked me dead in the eye. He said, well, I don't believe. I 
never had anybody come forward and tell me that before. He did not believe in who Jesus was and what Jesus did on the cross. Why he came down, I still was a little foggy in my mind. I said, look, and I talked to him for a minute, and I told him, I said, don't leave after service. I said, I need to talk with you. I sat him down, and I talked to him for a long time, sitting right over about where David and Ann sit. He left here still confused because he did not believe. He did not believe. The nation of Israel was taken from Egypt by miracles of God. Taken through the Red Sea, another miracle. Can you just imagine going through the Red Sea? I mean, one, one guy wrote, he said, Red Sea was only six inches deep. That's the reason they were able to walk there. And I said, well, isn't it a miracle how they drowned all them Egyptians in six inches of water? Got him either way he goes there. No, it was no six inches of water. How he determined that, I'd really like to know. But at any rate, he didn't believe. But those Israelites went through that water. God gave them manna from heaven. Imagine if he didn't have to cook, God just dropped it on the ground every morning for you to eat. Ooh, my wife loved that. She she cooks three meals a day, every day. That woman stays busy at the kitchen in the kitchen. But imagine, if you will, God gave them manna from heaven. He had all of these miracles. And he sent Jacob, or excuse me, Caleb and Joshua and ten other spies to go spy out the land. When they came back, everybody going, oh man, we can't do that. Oof, oof. They're too big. They're too powerful. Man, they're giants in that land. Joshua and Caleb said, oh yeah, we can, oh yeah, we can overcome it. Why? Because Joshua and Caleb believed. They believed this word. They believed God. They believed what he had to say. They believed everything that this word claimed. They believed the promises of the word of God. You've got to take these promises of this word. You've got to put them down in your heart. And you've got to read that. You've got to believe that. And you've got to stand on that and know. And know down in your spirit that, yeah, this is what God had to say. God don't lie. God is not a man that he should lie. For goodness sake, he is not a man that he should lie. He never lied to you one time, and he's not going to lie to you tomorrow. And if, if you don't believe this word, you're calling God a liar. It all has to do with belief. We accept it because we believe in God is who he is. And he can do what he says he can do. And he will do what he says. That's why we believe. Begin sometime very innocently at salvation. There has to be that belief. The Bible says, uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says, to believe, excuse me, to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's taking the word of God for what it is. And that's saying, this is true. This is true. If you accept that truth, if you receive that, if you will, as the charismatic like to say, I receive that. Oh, I receive everything in this thing. Amen. From Genesis to Revelation. If you'll do that, then your salvation experience begins with that, with accepting that word of God. You're no theologian when you first get saved, or most folks aren't anyway. There's probably exceptions to that rule. You're no theologian. You don't want to understand everything about Christ and Him crucified. You don't want to understand justification by faith. All you know is you need a Savior. The Holy Ghost begins to minister to you. And the Bible says that he draws you. The Lord draws you. That word draw literally means to drag. Because I think he has to drag us out of the devil's hands in order to get us to come to the Lord. And we come to that place where we go, yeah, this is what I need. I've seen people get saved that didn't have a clue about who Jesus was. Something happened down deep inside. They lived their life. You know, I lived my life like I wanted to. You heard me say it a hundred times. Forty-four years, buddy, I did it my way. Nobody going to tell me what to do. And God said, mm-hmm. He'd be eating them words. He began to minister to me. He began to deal with my heart. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to have had 18 years of, yeah, you going to church, boy. Whether you want to or not, get dressed and get it right, go. I had 18 years of teaching, so I had I had a little foundation there of understanding. But I've seen people who didn't. I've seen convicts didn't know nothing about God, curse God up to all of their lives. I've seen them fall down at the altar and cry because suddenly they believed. 
suddenly they believed in this man named Jesus, this word. They said, that man, Jesus, died for me. They don't have a, they don't have a theological understanding of it. They just understand that's what they need. That's the Holy Ghost working in that. That's that Holy Ghost working through that word. And it gets down inside of them. Oh, I want you to get this this morning. Once you get it down inside of you, you've got to give it control. You need to, you need to quit being the boss. Okay? I was the boss for 44 years, and God said, you ain't the boss no more. You know, we're always telling our brothers, you ain't the boss of me. God says, you ain't the boss of me either. I'm the boss. Amen. I'm making a little bit light there. But salvation is not a light thing. Amen. It changed my life. I accepted it. And the, and, and the acceptance of that turned my world upside down. Amen. I began to see things totally with a different set of eyes. I began to feel things with a different heart. I began to accept things without that constant negativity that word just accepting it for what it is and what it's all about I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here in just a second I'm having to re-scrabble my notes here because we're not going in the direction I thought we were going to go this morning but that's okay God's in control without this word how would we know what it is that God wants of us it's more than just the commands of the Bible. I mean, you know, there are, there are more. People say, well, we have ten commandments. Well, there's ten commandments, but there's a whole lot more commandments in the Bible than that. And God tells us that if we love him, we'll obey him. So to obey his word, you've got to accept its authenticity excuse me, and its authority. When a, when a police officer gets behind you and pulls you over, you accept his authority to have the ability to do that. When you go before the judge and he sentences you for your fine or whatever you were speeding or whatever, you accept his authority. You don't like it, but you accept his authority that he has the right to do that. We live in a country that a lot of people hate and a lot of people are cursing and, and talking about how bad it is right now. I don't see anybody moving out. I don't see anybody moving to Venezuela. Uh, I don't see anybody moving to some of these uh, uh, Arab countries. But I see a lot of them coming here. They don't want to accept the authority that this nation's laws declare. We accept the authority of this word. When you accept it, that means that when this word tells me, Thou shalt not steal, I need to quit stealing. When it says to honor my mother and my father, I need to honor them says I shall not commit thou shalt not commit adultery I don't need to commit adultery and these are things that we know because most of the laws in the world are based on the principles of this word of God think about that they're not based on the principles of Islam they're not based on the principles of Hinduism they're not based on the principles of Buddha they're not based on the principles of new age, not based on what man thinks, but nearly all the laws in the world, the godly law, are, are laws of, of, of countries who are, are at least a Christian nation. They're all based on the principles of the Word of God. So don't tell me this nation wasn't founded by Christianity because the laws are written and framed within the understanding of what this word says. Amen? Did we all do it all right? Was everything, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what the laws are based on. Yeah, we've made a lot of mistakes in this country. Still making them. But the authenticity of this word to declare who, who, who God is, what he's all about, amen, shows us how to obey his word got to know what his word says before you can do it. you got to know who it's from, who it's to, and what it's all about. Michael, y'all going up. I did to get to my other three points this morning, and I don't want to apologize for going over a little bit this morning because I wanted to make sure you got this part. We'll finish this next week.
week or so. But I don't want you to forget the moving of the Spirit this morning. Right. We've had moves of the Spirit before. We will have them again. Well, uh, like I say, I believe that's the tip of the iceberg that's coming to this right. church. Amen. I believe that's the. I say I believe that's the tip of the iceberg just coming to this church. And if I told you you got a free dinner after church day, you'd be a little more excited about that than you are. Am I right? Huh? You know, some of you done forgot it already. Don't forget what God did here this morning. Don't forget what those words said and how you claimed those words and how that got. I, if it didn't get down in you, you need to go home and start praying. Right. I'm going to tell you, it got down in me. The first, they started a the song. I thought, well, I don't think I've heard them sing this before. And my first thought and my second thought was, oh, God is in this. Amen. I'm not bragging on the praise and worship Amen. team. They do a great job. You know how I feel about all of these yes. dedication and the work that they do. But I'm talking about the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Spirit of God, you know, we used to sing a song, uh, 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 Breaking the Chains in this church. Hadn't sang it in a while, but that's a song that they've done before. Every time that song is sang, Spirit of the Lord moves. Now, I don't know why the Spirit of the Lord anoints some songs more than others. But again, it never needs to be ignored when, the, when you feel the Spirit of God moving. That's accepting what this word says because this word tells us a lot about praise and worship and one of the things Crossway Church listen to me give me your ear have ears to hear Amen. we need to learn how to worship God Amen. some of us are, are getting into it some of us still don't quite get it worshiping God means you're focused on Him Amen. it's not about the song it's not the words of the song or the melody of the song it's about the Spirit of the Lord moving during that part of the service. Amen. And that's a time for you to interact with God. Amen. Yes. It's like when you come and pray. It's like the altar call. Another weakness we have here at Crossway Church. We don't utilize the altar. We think if I go to the altar, people are going to think I'm a weak Christian and I need a lot of help. Newsflash, we all need a lot of help. Amen. Okay? Yes. Amen. We need to learn how to use this altar. God moves. There's an anointing upon the altar. There's an anointing upon the praise and worship. That's when God begins to speak to hearts. That's when God takes tumors. That's when God does this and does that. Whatever it is that He wants to do is during these times. Can God do it going down the road? Of course He can. He can do anything anytime He wants to. But if you don't honor the praise and worship, if you don't honor the altar call, then you're missing out on opportunities for God to do things. Some of us say, well, I've been praying for this for a long, long time, and I've never seen you once come to the altar. The answer might be down here at the altar. Yes. You tell me i got to go to the altar to get an answer from God? No, I'm just telling you, that might be where God's got it for you. Amen. And if you're too stubborn to come to the altar, if you're too stubborn to get involved in the praise and worship, maybe he's talking to you about your stubbornness. That's right. Ooh, preacher's talking mean now. Being mean to that crossway church, boy. <laughs> I'm not being mean to you. I'm trying to open your eyes. Yes, amen. Trying to get you to see what God wants you to see. Amen? amen. Praise God. Altar's open at this time. Heavenly Father, we come right now, Lord God, and I just come today to thank you, Lord, for all that you've done.